on a cold night. Uh, so I don't know who this don't talk is for. <laughs> <laughs> Because it is an exhortation to diligence, and um, and actually three three different themes um, were identified for me. So I have to figure out how to pull three talks into one. Uh, but I'm going to give a uh, I'm going to need a, a ten minute when ten minutes before my time is up, so I can wrap it up. <laughs> um, but let's see where this goes. You know, the wonderful thing about uh, Dhamma, I mean, we can pick something to talk about, but then we're just like picking something to talk about. But if you sit still in the emptiness, something arises that can be useful for someone. You know, these were not uh, studies that the Buddha uh, crafted and put together, but it was actual discussions with um, the people who were in front of him. And sometimes he explained things in one way, and he explained the same thing in another way to another to another group of people or to another individual. And so, being the the kind of organized, um, scholastic, thoughtful, uh, planning kind of people we are, we like everything to be done, you know, like in a certain way. And this is it. This is the method. This is the order. Uh, and we get a little bit perturbed when. Uh, it's not like uh, carried out in that, in that repetitious way. But the Buddha encourages us to be in the moment with the wisdom that is coming and to kind of, uh, in this way, we uh, become unified with the Dharma as it is, uh, as it is, going, as it is going forth. And uh, so between these three talks, they sort of dovetail on each other, but it's about specific questions that uh, disciples had or those who would be disciples had. And so the first one was when the Buddha was talking with um, a group of Brahmin householders and they had some of their most senior teachers there with them. And there was a, a young uh, student there, and the senior teachers were discoursing with the Buddha, but he kept interrupting and having something to say or asking a question or, you know, and after a while, and it's very rare that, that the Buddha does this, but at this time he rebuked him and he said, um, why don't you wait until we finish talking and then you can, you know, ask anything you want to ask. Uh, he repeatedly broke in and interrupted their, their talk. And he said, let not the venerable one break in and interrupt the talk of the very senior Brahmins while they are conversing. Let him wait until the talk is finished. And then when this was said, someone came to, uh, Go to my and he and he said, "Oh, please don't rebuke him because of our of our young of our young students. He is a very learned class, uh, clansman. He has a good delivery. He's wise. He's capable of taking part in this discussion with with you, with Master Magodama." And the and it says, "And the blessed one thought, surely, since the Brahmins honor him thus, he must be accomplished." in the Vedas. And that student was thinking, when the recluse Godama catches my eye, I'll ask him a question. And then knowing with his own mind the thought that the Brahmin had, the Buddha turned to him and looked him in his eye. <laughs> and he asked him a question. And he said, Master Godama, in regard to the ancient Brahmanic hymns that have come down through oral transmission, preserved in the collections. The Brahmins come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. What do you have to say about that? And the Buddha said, um, how is it that there is even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, 
Only this is true. Anything else is wrong. And he began to question him about the, the ancient uh, teachers. And he said, the ancient Brahmin seers, the creators of the hymns, the composers of the hymns, whose ancient hymns that were formerly chanted, uttered, and compiled, the Brahmins nowadays still chant and repeat them, repeating what was spoken then and reciting what was recited then. Did even these ancient Brahmin seers say thus, we know this, we see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong? And they said, no, Master Gautama. He said, so then it seems among the Brahmins that there's not even a single Brahmin who says thus, I know this, I see this, only this is true, anything else is wrong. And so he said, the young man said, well, the Brahmins honor this out of faith, Master Gautama. He said, but they also honor it out of oral tradition. And he said, first you took your stand on faith. Now you're talking about oral tradition. He said, there are five things that may turn out in two different ways here and now. What five? Faith, approval, oral tradition, reasoned cognition, and reflective acceptance of a view. And he said, so if you're standing on faith, or you're standing on oral tradition. So he just saved them the trouble of coming up with some other things. Uh, he said, all five, it's these five. And he said, now some things may be fully accepted out of faith, yet they may be empty, hollow, and false. But something else may not be fully accepted by faith, yet it may be factual, true, and unmistaken. The same with things that have received approval by the masters, or the same with oral traditions. Uh, the same with reason, cognition, and reflective acceptance of a view. It said, so it is not proper for a wise man who preserves truth to come to the definite conclusion, only this is true, anything else is wrong. You know, and, and it's such a wise lesson for us because every time, you know, you know, no matter what we're studying, whatever we embrace at the moment, that is the highest and the best. Otherwise, why would I be studying it? You know, so, <laughs> so we get this idea that, ha ha, I have finally found, I finally found the truth. This is true. And then we just start slicing and dicing and cutting up everything else. And, and all, all else is false. And the Buddha says, this is not, you know, the manner of a wise person. And so he reminds us that we can hold fast to not only what we know to be true, but if it's something that is praised by those that we consider wise and we have not realized it ourselves, we can hold on to it by faith. And he calls this preserving the truth by faith. So some preserve the truth by faith until they come into a direct knowledge of the truth. And some preserve the truth by, um, and they will not accept until they have actually uh, seen and known something for themselves. And so he said, in this way, there is the preservation of truth in the way one preserves the truth, in the way we recognize how to preserve the truth. And he says a householder or, or a householder's son goes to the teacher and investigates him in regards to three states. And he said those three states are uh, greed, hatred, and delusion. And it says that one who is, uh, this Dharma cannot be easily taught by one who is affected by greed. Cannot be easily taught by one who is affected by hatred, cannot be easily taught by one who is affected by delusion. He says, so one should investigate the teacher, and, have, and when he has done that and seen that he is purified from states based on hate, greed, and delusion, he says, then one should hold that which is shared 
in a good heart. One can accept by faith or one can uh, accept by direct experience, by reasoning. One can accept by the oral tradition and by receptive, reflective acceptance of the view. And so then I want to go to how we get to or arrive at the final truth. So he used the word final truth. And that helps us to be okay with where we are. Be okay with what we do understand. Be okay with what we accept. And it, allow, uh, uh, accept. And it allows us to also be okay with what we don't understand. And there's a way that we can respectfully be okay even with what we don't accept. So he's speaking about having a certain kind of respect for the teacher and a certain kind of respect you could call the dominant teacher when he was dying. You know, they said, well, who, who are you going to appoint to, to take over the community? Who's going to be our teacher? He said, when did I ever say I was your teacher? He said, let the dominant be your teacher. <laughs> so, so if we take the dharma as our, our teacher, then he says, hold those things that, that we don't know to be true for ourselves. If we have examined and found that the teacher is uh, uh, free from greed, hatred, and delusion, then we can hold the teaching in, uh, just hold it gently, even those things that we don't uh, uh, agree with, the things we, you know, this whole thing about challenging, you know, the, the teacher without, you know, the hardest thing for us to overcome is our own view, our own view, our own opinion of things. That, you know, so, if, now I'm just speaking for me, if I'm sharing the Dharma and I'm taking it from the Dharma, then if you disagree with that, like I don't really care. If I'm, you know, because I could even disagree with it and I wouldn't care. You know, I, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the Dharma speak at that time. And then I'm going to apply these, these five methods or one of the five. You know, I'm going to take it by faith until it's proven wrong. You know, or by reason, or by, you know, so he gives us the method of how to get the most out of the teaching. Right away, yup, don't believe that. Right away, we're like, uh, our mind is just running, well, this is what I think, you know. And so he's, he's telling us how to get the most out of the teaching. How to receive it in such a way that it will unpack for us. It will untie itself through our non-resistance. We can come to the to the uh, the depth of the dharma through non-resistance. So much of what we have to reason through is because we can't lightly hold and accept. Now, then we pull out that scripture. Yeah, well, he said, don't don't believe it just because it's written in your in your scriptures. Don't believe it because I said it. Don't you know? Put it into the culture of your experience. But we take that a little bit too far. We take that in our regular way. Of, of taking everything, you know, because I'm the one who knows, and if I don't know it, then it's suspect. You know, but he teaches us how to approach the giver of the Dharma, and how to approach the Dharma so that it can be of good effect in our lives. If we want to really know something, he's saying give the Dharma a chance to get in and mix, you know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, a little yeast makes the whole batch rise. You know, and he's saying if you will allow the Dharma to do its work, it will have its effectual working in you. And things will become clear to you. Things will become plain for us. And what we couldn't understand, you know, we will understand. I used to uh, have a, I know I've probably said it to you before, but my book, um, uh, my middle of this course that I'm writing all in the margin. That's not true. I tried that. That doesn't work. I don't believe that. You know, and, and that was before I found this sutta that told me how, how to accept and come and how to come, how to approach the, the Dharma. And, but the thing is that when I go back and I look at it, I'm like, how could I have not understood that? I mean, it's plain as a nose on my face. How could I, how could, how could I have had any problem with this? You know, why didn't that make sense 
to me. You know, it makes such perfectly good sense. Not because somebody sat down and instructed me on that particular thing. You know, but a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little yeast makes all the dough rise. It's something like that. We don't have to learn every single thing. But when we learn something, it has this insidious way of infecting all of our ignorance. And bit by bit, it falls. It falls away. And so, there's another suitor called the grade of the tamed. And this prince came, and he was speaking to a novice who was living in the forest. And he said, um, I've heard that a bhikkhu who abides here diligent, ardent, and resolute can achieve unification of mind. And he said, that is so, Prince, that is so. He said, then it would be good if you would teach me the Dharma as you have learned it and mastered it. He said, I can't teach you the Dharma as I've learned and mastered it, Prince. For if I were to teach you the Dharma as I've heard it and mastered it, you wouldn't understand the meaning of my words. And that would be wearying and troublesome for me. <laughs> He said, no, let the master teach me the Dharma as he has heard it and mastered it. Uh, perhaps I can understand the meaning of his words. He said, okay, I'll teach you the Dharma, Prince, as I've heard it uh, from the Blessed One and as I have mastered it. And if you can understand the meaning of my words, that will be good. But if you cannot understand the meaning, then leave it at that and do not question me about it further. Uh, and so... The novice taught uh, Prince Jayasena the Dharma as he had heard it and mastered it. And after he had spoken, the prince remarked, it's impossible. <laughs> it cannot happen that a bhikkhu who by his diligent, ardent, and resolute can achieve unification of mind. I, I don't understand it. And he left. And soon after, the prince saw the Buddha. And after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he like shared that entire conversation. And the Buddha said to his disciple, how is it that the prince living in the midst of sensual pleasures, enjoying sensual pleasures, being devoured by thoughts of sensual pleasures, being consumed by the fever of sensual pleasures, bent on the search for sensual pleasures, how could he know, see, or realize that which must be known? through renunciation, seen through renunciation, attained through renunciation, realized through renunciation. That is impossible. And then he began to tell him how he should have spoken with the prince. He said, you just gave him the straight up Dharma and he couldn't, he couldn't receive it. He said, but what do you think? Suppose there were two tameable elephants horses or oxen that were well tamed and well disciplined and two tameable elephants, horses or oxen that were untamed and undisciplined. He said, what do you think? Would the two tameable elephants, horses or oxen that were well tamed and well disciplined being tamed acquire the behavior of the tamed? Would they arrive at the grade of a tamed? He said, yes. He said, well, what about the ones that were untamed? He said, if they were untamed and undisciplined, being tamed, acquire, would they acquire the behavior of the tamed? Would they arrive at the grade of the tamed, like two tameable elephants, horses, or oxen? He said, no. He said, so it's impossible then that the prince living in the midst of grasping and craving for the world could know, see, or realize that which can only be known through renunciation. And then he gave another example, and he gave another example. And so he said, the prince is obstructed, he's hindered, he's blocked, and enveloped by a still greater mass than this, the mass of ignorance. Thus, it is impossible for him to really get it. But if these two similes had occurred to you with reference to the prince, 
He would have spontaneously acquired confidence in you. And being confident, being confident, he would have shown his confidence to you. And then he could have listened and he could have heard in a different way. Now, this is usually a teaching that I would give to a teacher. But I give it to you so that you can understand sometimes why a teacher teaches in a certain way or why teaching a certain thing or why because you may know more than that particular thing he and his decision to give a certain amount to a certain group why that is wise and why that's beneficial for him. but yeah but i want to talk about this 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 and this but they but they don't know this is not the right form for it he said in this in this way if you understand that then you uh, inspire confidence in the teacher. So, i like to finish up in 70. Because that's the backdrop. Oh, no, yes. And he said, he talked about in this suit about the seven kinds of disciples. Anybody know what they are? What kind of disciple are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, everybody uh, go home and Google Suda number seven in the Virginia Nikata. And at least figure out what kind of disciple you are. He said there are these seven kinds of disciples. Norma, you got your householder, this one. You have on. Um, hold on, hang on. There are these seven kinds to be found. There's the one liberated in both ways, one liberated by wisdom, one is a body witness, one is one attained to view, one's liberated by faith, one's a Dharma follower, and one's a faith follower. So you a faith follower, Dharma follower, liberated by faith, attained to view, by witness, uh, liberated by wisdom, or liberated in both ways. And I remember when I first found this suit, and I found myself. I was at the bottom, <laughs> a faith follower. That's it. Yeah. And uh, and I was around this group, and they were like so intellectual, you know, and they talking all of this head stuff. And I'm like, what happened to the heart? What happened to the mind of the heart? They were like, y'all got the wrong head. It's mm -hmm. the it's the mind of the of the heart because that's the way the way I saw it. Uh, but I was just sitting with the wrong group, you know, because they were all ones who were trying to uh, attain uh, by wisdom being a Dharma follower. And, and I came as a faith follower. And they looked down on who their doses on the, on the faith followers. <laughs> <laughs> but when I found myself in, when I found myself in the suit, I, I was a okay. You know? <laughs> See, I told y'all I was right. I knew what I was, you know, but I never heard anybody. No one pointed it out to me. And then he goes on and he describes these different ones. And he says, um, faith follower is a person who does not contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial transcending forms. And his tanks are not yet destroyed, so he's not biting in the formless genres and all of that. He says, yet, he has the faith faculty. He has energy. He has mindfulness, concentration, and he has some wisdom, but he still has work to do with diligence. 
and he needs to go off and then goes to go onto the root of a tree and, and he's given the case for, for meditative attainment in the Jhanas. Okay. And he says that this kind of person has heard the teachings of the Buddha, but he doesn't know whether they're true or not, but something has inspired confidence in him that they are true. And that is the faith follower. The Dharma follower also does not abide in uh, the immaterial jhanas. But, and his taints are not yet destroyed by seeing with wisdom, but those teachings by the Tathagata are accepted after reflecting on them and coming to some conclusion, then he understands them sufficiently with wisdom. He says, I still say that he has work to do. He needs to go to the root of a tree. The kind of person liberated by faith, he is still uh, not abiding in those peaceful and immaterial uh, states transcending forms, but some of his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. And his faith is now planted, rooted, and it's established in the Tathagata. And this is one that is called one who is liberated by faith. Then there is one attained to view. He also does not abide in the peaceful and immaterial transcending form. But some of his paints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. And he has reviewed and, de- and examined the wisdom of the teachings proclaimed by the Tathagata. And this kind of person is called one attained to view, but he still has work to do. And then he says, what kind of person is a body witness? Here this person does contact with the body and abide in those liberations that are immaterial, transcending forms. And some of his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. And this kind of person is called a body with a witness that he still has work to do with diligence. that he may realize for himself with direct knowledge here and now and enter and abide in, in that supreme goal of the holy life for the sake of which clansmen rightly go forth. He says, and what kind of person is one liberated by wisdom? Here some person does not contact with the body or abide in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms, but his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. That kind of person is called one liberated by wisdom. And what kind, I'm, I do not say of such a bhikkhu that he still has work to do. Why is that? He has done his work with diligence. And what kind of person is one liberated in both ways? He is some person contacts with the body and abides in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms and his taints are destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. And this is a person called one liberated in both ways. And I do not say that he has work to do. Why is that? He has done his work. He is, uh, with diligence, he's no more capable of being negligent, and he has a tranquil body here and now. And so he speaks of these seven kinds. And I needed to know what kind I was. You know? So after I got this explanation, I knew. I knew where I was. I found myself in the Dharma. And then I began to seek out the teachings that would be beneficial for one, uh, for a, a faith follower. Being a faith follower led me to being a Dharma follower. Mm-hmm. So I had like a little bit of the mix, faith and Dharma. Better than just faith, better than just Dharma. Got a little bit of two. And bringing them together. And then I started uh, reading about what is it? What are these? Uh, what is he talking about when he talks about abiding in those liberations that are peaceful and immaterial, transcending forms? And, and I'm like, oh, they don't talk about that. They said, oh, that's dangerous. Don't look over into those things. You know, you just better get mindfulness. And so. Uh, so I started looking up everything I could about these the states that he was talking about. You know, so let the Dharma be your guide. Uh, and so then starting to to 
follow the instruction. He gives them throughout this book. I think it's 150, 55 uh, suitors in here, and probably 150 give the instructions of what to do after you get to the root of that tree, how to sit, how to, where to turn the mind. And, uh, and so this is the work that we have to do. If I wait to get it all from my teacher, the time will pass me by. But he talks about being diligent, being ardent, and being resolute. That's why he said, he said that we have to rely upon ourselves. So there's a confidence we have in the teacher. There's a confidence we have in the Dharma. But there's also a confidence we have to establish and grow in ourselves to be responsible for our own development. To be And to do work. I mean, you see the teacher once a week, twice a week, but you do the other five days. Yeah, this is that every every day, every chance we get, we should be seeking our salvation, and we find it within ourselves. There is a place that we go when we fold inward, that we can can reach that clear, luminous, bright mind. There are some conditions for getting in there. He said, having set aside covetousness and grief for the world. That means whatever you came in here to see and think about, you got to lay it all down now. Otherwise, there's no point in even meditating. You're just thinking about what you're thinking about. But he says that before you start to meditate, you have to lay all that down. Whatever went good today, whatever went bad today, whatever you're thinking about is going to happen tomorrow or what happened yesterday. He said you have to lay all of that down. You can pick it up in how long we meditate, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. You can pick it back up there. But right now, it's just a matter of are you willing to lay it all down to see what the Dharma will reveal to you, to give heed to the teacher, to the Dharma, to be open, to hear the voice of the Dharma speak to you from the inside. To touch those places that are immaterial. To look for a wisdom that is broader, vaster, deeper than our ordinary common sense. So we, uh, we have enough common stuff. If I wanted something else common, I wouldn't bother to come to this Dharma that I've been told was so sublime. The tamer of gods and men, they call the Buddha. I came for that. I don't want it to be uh, polluted and watered down by our ordinary thinking. I want to take it as it's offered and put it into the cauldron of my experience and see, allow it to transform, allow it to renew, allow it to change, allow it to transmit directly to me. Developing a unification of mind with the dawn. And so he says that we have to put forth a little bit of effort for that to happen. He says, first we have to be willing to let go of all the things that we cling to, our pet peeves. You know, misery loves company. So even if we, you know, have something bad going on, that's all we got going on in our life. Like, we got to hold on to that. It's better than not having anything. You know, but we, lay, we are willing to let go of our offense, you know, who has offended us, whatever we're offended over, we're willing to, to let go of our humiliation. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. You know, you know, don't you know people? And they're constantly just talking about how they're not good enough and how they're not worthy. And I have no self-esteem. And I, you know, even you have to let that go for a minute. Okay, if you want to pick that up on the way out the door, fine. But for now, we lay it down. And whatever we're thinking, we're leaving it all, all open to reinterpretation in the light of the dawn. So that's the anticipation we bring. It's not a jagged kind of anticipation, but it's the kind that's inspiring, you know, that is hopeful, it's focused, and we bring our energy to that. And then we just sit with it until we become unified in mind.
the Dharma. And it washes away our ignorance, washes away, obliterates our greed. You know, I had um, I had a, um, a series of concussions, and so I lost uh, some of my, my memories. And sometimes it's difficult for me to pull my thoughts together. And I have to, like, kind of go out into that, that empty space, you know, because that's where I can find them. When I keep them in time, I can't always find them. But when I just power down, you know, like that priest that comes up to the, I like that God, like that priest that comes up to the star and it just powers down. Then whatever thought I was trying to grasp, it's like right there, dancing in front of my face. But it's Paniwati must increase, uh, must decrease. And then the Dharma increases. So for a lot of us, it's it's decreasing. Decreasing in our our arrogance, decreasing in what we think we know, decreasing in how clever we are, decreasing in how good we are, decreasing in how bad we think we are, you know, decreasing in however we're thinking. Just power down. A lot of times they call it a beginner's mind. But I tell you, at the top end, it's more useful than even at the beginning. At the beginning, you use a little bit of sense. But then, as you start encountering the dawn, uh, it's like wading out into that stream, and you find that it has a pull and a current, and it takes you where it's going. And if you don't resist, you can't even withstand the pull of the current. It's no way that you not uproot and be separated from your ignorance. There's no way that we'll not be uprooted and separated from greed. It's no way that we'll not abandon hatred. So in these times when everybody seems to be calling for more, and calling for vengeance, and I don't know what they're using as a thinking mechanism, because some of the decisions that's coming out of powerful places make no sense at all. We're either going to be swept up in the energy of that, or we can become unified with the energy of the dawn. We choose. So I'm asking you tonight to make a choice. Hey, that sounds like an altar call. <laughs> Imagine me tonight <laughs> to make a choice. Will you choose this wonderful Dharma? And then when you choose it, don't like half, don't do things half baked. Just go, go all the way, go hog wild. You know, I mean, put your effort and your energy into it. Turn your face towards it, your direction, being willing to lay aside what you already know, to know something else, to know more, to know better. <clears throat> and allow the Dharma to instruct you. It only takes a few words, rightly spoken, here and there, to allow the shackles to fall from the mind and the scales from our eyes. That seeing we can see and here we can understand. And so as we go into our meditation tonight, do you all take a break? Hmm? Do you all take a break? Oh, great, wonderful. <laughs> you know, that bathroom break just destroys the whole stream. <laughs> so, so as you go into your sit tonight, I'd like to guide you just a little bit at the beginning. He gave some wonderful instructions to his son, Rahu. You can Google it, Sutta number 62. Greater advice to his, son, to his son. I'm not saying he was partial, but whatever he said to his son, I pay close attention to, just saying. And so he said, Rahu, let your meditation be like the earth, like the air, like fire like water, like 
space. He said you can spit in the wind, you can throw trash on the earth, throw garbage in the water, you can throw debris in the fire. And they are not offended, neither are they humiliated, neither are they disgusted. So now you think about it. Whenever anything negative is on your mind, not useful, not beneficial, not helpful, unpleasant, it's primarily through offense, offended at, at something that happened or something somebody said, you know, something somebody did or a sense of humiliation or shame. I got fired off my, I, you know, I uh, wrecked my car. Uh, I performed badly on my exam. I was disgusted. And he said, coming into meditation, gotta let all that go. Just for now. That all of the God. The thing is that when we do that, immediately the body starts to feel relieved. And the mind is lighter. It negates thinking about the past or worrying about the future. And it just allows us for just a little while to step out of time and just embrace stillness. And then he told him, then you got to get your joy going. So, arousing loving kindness and compassion altruistic joy for others can bring to mind if your day wasn't a good day, somebody had a good day. Maybe the person who won when you lost. And just be happy for them that they won. You know, some days you win, some days you don't. Suddenly you bring things back into balance. It's not all one way or the other. Mm, seeing it that way is just called being adult. Just understanding that in life we there is sort of like this seesaw, like there is praise and there is blame, there is loss and there is gain, there is pleasure and there is pain, there is fame and there is shame. We like four of those and we don't like the other four, but they go together. And some days it'll be this and some days it'll be that. And remembering that allows this moment to be whatever it is, whichever side of the candle it is. It's just another day in the life. laying down our art against everyone. Allowing compassion to arise 
And rather than condemning the person, just recognizing the ignorance that produces that kind of thought or that kind of action. Kind of sets the picture around. And this is all the efforting that we have to do tonight. It's just coming to the conclusion, the decision, that for the time of our sit, we will lay down, abandon. we begin to realize it's not so much what happened to us today, but how we've chosen to hold on to our thoughts, our assessments about them. And the pain and the anguish that we have caused ourselves, having more to do with our own thoughts about things. So we're really aggravating ourselves. How dumb is that? When we see it so firmly, then we are willing to drop. judgments of things. And in that process, some lightning, some levity enters into the heart. And some release, some freeing into the mind. And there is some contentment that begins to emerge. That contentment is born of our own efforts. As we become stable inside. Yes, all. 
also confidence that begins to arise. That I can handle what concerns me today. 